Okay, so it's been a little while since I have done a film review, uh, and I sort of had um, inconsistent uh, series of videos on films I feel are or underrated, and this film definitely, definitely falls into that category. Um, it's a film I've known for a very long time. I've seen it many times. I've just watched it again, um, and the film is Gettysburg, nineteen ninety three. So um, I'm going to try and keep this as tidy as possible, but if, uh, if there's a little bit of flip-flopping and so on, it's because there's a lot I want to include. And um, yeah, I'll, I'll try my best to, to make this as sort of tidy as possible. So Gettysburg, um, this is the film in question. Uh, is that properly there? Um, that's the DVD version. I've actually just had to stick on my video version. Uh, which is in two parts, and you can see it's had a lot of wear and tear because the DVD was freezing. Now, uh, the wear and tear on this just gives an indication of how much I've seen it. Um, in my family, this film has a sort of uh, almost generational thing going on because my father watched it with his father, my late grandfather, when it was released in 1993, and I first saw it around 1996 uh, when. A couple actually from Gettysburg, Pennsylvania were staying with us and they sort of set up a link with my father so that we could go to the United States. Um, we were there for a month, uh, July 1999. Um, so we could say that this is a lot more than film to me. Uh, I've actually got a personal connection, albeit I have to emphasise a distant one. A relative of mine, Charles Edward Hazlitt, um, fell at Gettysburg. He was from Ohio, he commanded a battery at Little Round Top, which was one of the sites of the battle. And he's actually briefly mentioned in the film, um, in a scene where, well, I'll come to that in a little bit. Okay, so the first thing to say about this film is that it's a long film. It is a very long film, over four hours long. So it's one of the longest films released by a major studio in, certainly in my lifetime. Um, that even surpasses Gone with the Wind in terms of uh, length. And its prequel, Gods and Generals, which will, I will mention briefly, um, is also very long. Um, so I'm going to say just some basic details about the film. It was directed by Ronald F. Maxwell, produced by Moctezuma Esparza and Robert Katz. And it's based on the novel The Killer Angels by Michael Chara. This is a 1974 novel. Um, which won the Blitzer Prize, I believe. I haven't actually read this yet. But I definitely keep meaning to get around to it. The way the novel's written, it's focusing on several of the commanders. And the film more or less takes that sort of approach. Um, there are, of course, some differences, which I won't talk about in great detail because I haven't read the novel in full. Um, but my father, myself, my brother had a big interest in this film. My brother later joined the army, in fact. So um, uh, whether that had an influence or not, I don't know, but uh, my brother actually later joined the army and my father also served uh, in Northern Ireland in the 80s. Anyway, um, some other details. So based on this novel, The Killer Angels by Michael Shara, it's a big cast, uh, lots of big names, which I'll come to in a minute. Um, narrated by W. Morgan Shepherd, who actually plays one of the commanders in the film. Um, Let's see, music by Randy Edelman. That's very important because I think the soundtrack of this film, I always I always put quite a lot of weight on soundtracks because I think that they're more than just um, dressing. I think they do really help a film. A memorable soundtrack really is something. And Gettysburg had a very original soundtrack. Uh, it wasn't just generic, what I would call war movie uh, dramatic music. It was very unique and very moving. The production company was Turner Pictures and Ted Turner actually um, had a small cameo role in the film. Um, it was released on October 1993. Um, now, this is an interesting thing. It had a budget of just $20 million and it made just $12.7 million. I find this quite staggering because it is an epic film. But this may be less to do with its reception than the fact that it actually had limited release. Um, why it had limited release, I don't know, um, but that's a great pity, because I feel that many, many people, you know, when you see lists of greatest war movies, 
Gettysburg never gets a mention. Gods and Generals doesn't even get a mention. And I, I think that's a travesty. I'm prepared to go out there and say it. I've seen many war films. You know, there's famous war films like Saving Private Ryan, um, The Thin Red Line. They're great movies and they deserve all the credit they get. But Gettysburg is massively underrated. I really don't understand why this film doesn't get more attention. Um, critical acclaim is, was quite good, actually. But um, it wasn't universal. Uh, for example, um, Roger Rebert of the Chicago Sun Times gave the film three out of four stars, saying this is a film that Civil War buffs will find indispensable, even if others might find it in interminable. Um, uh, on the other hand, Gene Siskel gave it a thumbs down, saying the film was bloated Southern propaganda. I could not disagree more, and I'll come to that in a minute. He, however, also praised Daniel's performance and recommended his, his nomination for an Oscar. He mentions Daniels there, that's a reference to Jeff Daniels. Um, Jeff Daniels plays the Union commander, Joshua Lawrence Chamberlain, who had the rank of colonel at Gettysburg. And he famously led a charge at Little Round Top on the second day, in which he was protecting the 20th Maine's left flank of the Union army as Confederates were coming up the hill. And he took an unlikely manoeuvre of sweeping down the hill. And that move may well have saved the Union Army. There's some debate over it, but it's a very famous move. And Chamberlain, who came from an academic background, uh, is was rightly hailed as one of the heroes of the of the Union side. But there's uh, a lot of big names in this film. Uh, Martin Sheen plays Robert E. Lee, the famous Confederate General Robert E. Lee. Tom Berenger plays General James Longstreet. John Buford plays a uh, Union General, uh, excuse me, not John Buford. Um, uh, Sam Elliott plays the famous uh, Union Commander, um, Brigadier General John Buford. Um, I actually discovered, just on watching this again, one of the composite characters in the film, who wasn't a historic character, but is an important character in both the book and the film, uh, Sergeant Buster Coleraine played by Kevin Conway. Kevin Conway passed away earlier this year, so uh, it's just one of those things you notice. He's one of the most memorable characters. He's only a sergeant, but he's an important role because he sort of represents the everyman in a sense, um, particularly the Irish immigrant sort of character. A tough, um, and uh, he, he dies in the film. The film does focus a lot on such things as military strategy, so in that sense, I guess, it's a conventional war film. I really, I've, I've seen many war films and I can't compare any other war film to this one, including other American Civil War films. Uh, I mean, Glory was a great movie with Matthew Broderick. Um, Cold Mountain's a great movie. But Gettysburg really is unique. Um, I can't think of anything else like it. Even its prequel, Gods and Generals, was a little bit more conventional. One noticeable thing about Gettysburg is in the entire film, there's hardly any women. Um, Gods and Generals, which is its prequel, it focuses on events before Gettysburg and has some of the same cast, uh, focuses more on the civilian side of things. Now, Gods and Generals is also a great film, um, and it features soundtracks from songs by Bob Dylan and uh, Mary Fowl. Um, but I, I really can't praise Gettysburg highly enough. It is, I can't explain, it's just such an original and emotive film. and. There will be some who say that it's um, it wouldn't be screened today. It would be controversial today on the ground that it takes a very neutral approach to both sides. It doesn't vilify the Union or the Confederacy. Uh, and I think the, f the fact it doesn't vilify the Confederacy might be a point of contention. Um, but what the film is about is not just the generals, but the ordinary men. And whilst, you know, I've no doubt that the moral high ground of the Confederacy was dubious at best, and I'm not a believer in the lost cause. I don't think the film can be dismissed as Cisco seemed to dismiss it as Southern propaganda. Um, the film's in two parts, and we can broadly look at that as being first day of the battle is more from the Union perspective, the second day of the battle is more from the Union perspective, the third day of the battle is more from the Confederate perspective. The famous Pickett's Charge. 
and I'd been there, and it was filmed, by the way, on site. Um, a lot of reenactors in this film. Um, but the idea that that amounts to Southern propaganda is nonsense. Of course it focuses on Southern generals. Of course it focuses on what their strategies were. It's a character called um, Arthur Fremantle, who was a historic character. He was a British officer of the Coldstream Guards. Now, it's one small thing the film got wrong. They presented him in his red tunic. Um, actually, he was technically a civilian observer. Um, he was wearing a deerskin um, coat. Um, deer stalker, is that the expression? Yeah. Uh, but he was a famous outside observer to the battle. Uh, and I couldn't help feeling there were British stereotypes in there. He was going around the battlefield with a cup of tea. I mean, literally. Uh, nevertheless, he's a memorable character. There's some great, great lines in this film. For example, there's a bit where um, Chamberlain is having a philosophical debate with this Sergeant Buster Coleraine about slavery and about racism, because Chamberlain was quite an ideologue, actually. Um, most soldiers, North and South, didn't care about the slaves. Joshua Lawrence Chamberlain came from a more ideological background, um, so he has this interesting conversation with Buster Coleraine, and it, it's a great monologue. Um, Chamberlain quotes Shakespeare, um, is man not a work of art? Or it's you know, verbatim, but it's along those lines. And at one point, Kilrain responds, well, if he's an angel, he must be a killer angel. And there, it's just one of many, many memorable lines in this film. It is a marathon, it's a long film. Um, and I appreciate that the, the military focus strategy and so on wouldn't be to everyone's taste. Some might find it a bit dull. Um, sometimes I would. I don't always find films focusing on military strategy that interesting. But the thing about Gettysburg is it really, really takes the human side of these men, the generals, the pressures they were under, uh, other commanders, but also the ordinary men. And I, I like the fact that it doesn't vilify either side. I mean, regardless of what you think of the South and the CSA and the evils of slavery, which is unquestionable, it's very, very hard not to be moved in that final scene with Pickett's charge. It's a profoundly moving scene. Um, you know, almost 13,000 men going across the fields, knowing many of them were going to die. I mean, it was madness. This was 18th century techniques versus 19th century warfare, um, which is why the casualties were so high. Gettysburg was the bloodiest battle of the American Civil War. Um, 53,000 fallen, at least 8,000 dead. Um, so it was a major, major battle. Um, in fact, at that point, the largest battle ever fought in the Western Hemisphere. Um, so really, you know, had its mark in history. Um, in fact, it's surprising there hasn't been feature films about Gettysburg before 1993. There was a brief reference to it in Gone with the Wind, where... Um, Rhett Butler says to Scarlett O'Hara, oh yes, I'm sure he's all there all right. And she asks him to say where Ashley is. And he goes, some little town in Pennsylvania called Gettysburg. It's one of those places like the Somme, Waterloo, Kursk, Stalingrad, that just sealed its way into history, um, in the history of warfare. Um, Gallipoli, Leningrad, there's others, but Gettysburg is definitely there. Um, so I mentioned the casters. Uh, Martin Sheen is Robert E. Lee. Uh, Jeff Daniels is Joshua Lawrence Chamberlain. Uh, a quick word about that. It's incredible that he then went on to do Dumb and Dumber. You could not find a bigger range with an actor from such a serious, poignant role as the hero of the Union Army at Gettysburg to, you know, Dumb and Dumber. So full respect to Jeff Daniels for that. Um, I think that was an Oscar-worthy performance, but 1993 was a strong year for film. Um, other roles, uh, Richard Jordan played General Armistead, who was one of the Confederates, Confederate generals who fell at Pickett's charge. And uh, Richard Jordan was actually dying himself at the time of cancer. Uh, he died sometime later, but um, you know, that shows dedication. Um, Brian Mallon played General Winfield Hancock. I actually have Brian Mallon's autograph. I think it must have been at one of the reenactments at the Ultra American Folk Park. If not in Gettysburg itself, I can't remember where I got the autograph. Um, I'm not suggesting he's a major actor, but 
he had a strong role in that film as General Hancock. And, you know, the film really shows how, even though these were warring sides, it really was the Brothers' War, because a lot of these generals knew each other. They'd been at West Point together. Um, one of the best examples of this was Hancock and Armistead, one Federal, one Confederate. And um, the dichotomy of that was really uh, well done. Um, the the casting was amazing. Uh, not all of these actors were household names, but the, they really, really got them to look like their historic counterparts. And I really like the start of the film, how they show the photos of the actors juxtaposed with the real people. Um, see Thomas Hoyle played Thomas Chamberlain, who was a lieutenant colonel of the 20th Maine under his brother, Joshua Lawrence Chamberlain. And if you look at the historic photo of Tom Chamberlain, it's incredible. He really does look like him, um, as do the others. I mean, uh, the casting was superb. Um, Stephen Lang, um, who had a big role in Avatar, uh, played General George Pickett, to whom the charge was named after. Um, and he also had a role in Gods and Generals, a very, very strong performance as General Stonewall Jackson. Um, I'm trying I'm trying not to omit anything here because I, I really think this film deserves more credit. Um, the soundtrack, the, the cinematography, the way the battle scenes were filmed, it wasn't just, okay, we'll get reenactors, we shoot it and that's it. The, the way it was done, the timing of the music, just everything was so, so powerful. And I freely admit that it has me in tears every time. It's one of only a few films that can do that. Um, I'm trying to think of some of the things to add. Um, let's see. Uh, yeah, like I say, the film sort of goes through the three days of the battles, of the battle. Um, on the first day, it covers a Confederate, kind of opens, in fact, with a Confederate messenger who was also an actor, uh, simply known as Harrison, Cooper Huckabee. He's got quite an important role, um, and it shows how he sort of sees the Union position. The interesting thing about the Battle of Gettysburg is uh, at the Battle the Confederates were coming from the north, and the Federal troops were coming from the south that day, so it's an interesting paradox, so to speak. Um, I'll leave it there because uh, I don't want to admit anything, but I think I've hopefully sold the film. If you haven't seen Gettysburg, check it out. This really is one of the best war films ever made, in my opinion. Um, I find it profoundly moving. I know it very, very well. I know all the generals, you know, all the commanders, the characters. Um, I haven't read The Killer Angels yet, but I intend to as soon as possible. Um, Gods and Generals, quick word about that. Like I say, it, it's a prequel to Gettysburg. In fact, there was three, there was originally meant to be three parts, Gettysburg, Gods and Generals, and I think the last one was called The Long Full Measure, um, or The Last Full Measure. It's never been broadcast, and uh, I hope it is. I really, really hope it is um, to have the full trilogy. Gods and Generals is also a very good film. Like I say, it's a little bit more conventional. It's also very long. It actually starts with Robert E. Lee being offered command of the Union Army, which is something not everyone realises. He was so high, highly respected in the War Department that they offered him command of the Union Army. But of course, history being what it was, he chose to side with us. He called it his country, the state of Virginia. Um, but the film really shows lots of aspects of it. Um, I don't think the film can be read as an apology of the lost cause. All it's doing is showing the Confederates at Gettysburg. It is what it is. Uh, and whatever you think of the context of the war, I think it's irrefutable that there was incredible courage, you know, to go across open field knowing they would, in many cases, die. Um, that's what it was. And surely that is um, a good way to present a film that is, after all, about a civil war. Uh, there are films that take one side over another. Gone with the Wind was heavily biased to the South. Glory was heavily, you know, on the North side. And I'm not saying there's ever wrong with that, but um, Gettysburg really is neutral. So if it has detractors, that might be the only reason. It's not saying that, it's not trying to say slavery was right or the lost cause was right. It's just saying these were the men involved. 
and this is what they were doing at the battle. This is the decisions they had to make. Um, and that's what it is. And like I said, it was filmed on the battlefield, so that's, there's not many films get permission to do that. Um, I'm trying to think of some other things to add. Let's see, big, big cast. Um, there's a lot of focus, like I say, particularly on Lee, Longstreet and Chamberlain. Um, Chamberlain, for example, is presented with some deserters. He's given the option to shoot them. He doesn't want to do that. Chamberlain's a very um, interesting character in the film, but what I like about Gettysburg is the generals and the commanders and the officers are all unique. You know, a lot of war films, I find I'm having to differentiate who's who. I need to keep playing back and thinking, who's that, who's that? Uh, but with Gettysburg, the, the character development is very well done. Um, there's a great scene, incidentally, on the first day where Buford, played by Sam Elliott, is awaiting the support of General Reynolds. And they play the fife and drum. And drum. It's a very good rendition of that military marching. Anyway, I'm going to run this up. Check it out. Gettysburg really is one of the most underrated films I have ever come across. And I just think it's a great pity it didn't have broader release. Because maybe other people would have seen it and appreciated it. I think it's really a pity that it doesn't get even in the conversation of greatest war films. Because to me, it really belongs there. Superb film. A lot of Oscar-worthy performances. Uh, very moving soundtrack. Check it out. Gettysburg, 1993. I should say Gods and Generals was released in 2003. And I really hope they release the long full measure. Or the last, I can't remember off the top of my head what the last part of the trilogy was called. Check it out. Gettysburg, 1993.